My name is David Armstrong. I'm the director of the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center. Welcome to our webinar series. Now, today's event is entitled Teledentistry, Bridging Oral Health Access Gaps in the Safety Net. Let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Fikshana Fernando. Fikshana is a research scientist at the Oral Health Workforce Research Center located at the University of Albany's School of Public Health. Fikshana, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And depending on where you're joining us from, good morning. So my name is Tikshna Fernando, and I am a researcher at the Oral Health Workforce Research Center. The webinar today is titled Teledentistry Bridging Oral Health Access Gaps in the Safety Net. So a couple of quick acknowledgements before I begin. Our work is funded by HRSA. I also want to acknowledge uh, the co-authors of the studies described in this webinar, Dr. Simona Sardu, the Deputy Director of the Oral Health Workforce Research Center, who unfortunately couldn't make it today, and Dr. Jean Moore, who is today, who is both the Director of the Oral Health Workforce Research Center and the Center for Health Workforce Studies. So a little bit about the Oral Health Workforce Research Center. The, like David mentioned, the Oral Health Workforce Research Center is based at the Center for Health Workforce Studies at the School of Public Health at the University at Albany in Albany, New York. It was established in 2014, and it is one of nine health workforce research centers that are funded by HRSA, and the only one that is uniquely focused on the Oral Health Workforce Research Center. This uh, on, on the oral health workforce. Uh, this webinar is a collaboration between the oral health workforce research center and the health workforce technical assistance center. And I want to thank Dr. David Armstrong for hosting this webinar and our incredible communications team for making this possible. So I want to start with uh, listing our learning objectives. The first one is to give all of you, uh, a reintroduction to teledentistry. Now, I, when we get to that section, I'm going to tell you why this is uh, a reintroduction and not an introduction. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the uptake of teledentistry services during the pandemic to discuss findings from one of our studies of key informant interviews and to outline the variation of teledentistry regulations by state. So, Let's start with understanding what teledentistry is. Teledentistry is the use of information and communications technology to deliver virtual oral health services in real time, which is called synchronous teledentistry, or through store and forward methods, which is asynchronous teledentistry. The services that can be delivered through teledentistry include examinations, uh, evaluations, diagnosis and treatment plans, uh, prescribing medications when it's indicated, uh, providing oral, oral health education for patients as well as remote patient monitoring. Uh, teledentistry has also been used to provide education and training of dental students, residents and clinicians and also for general and specialty dental consultations and referrals. Now, I want to take a minute here to reiterate that teledentistry cannot and was never intended to replace all the services that one may receive in person in the dental suite, but rather as an adjunct to those services. So teledentistry has been around for over 30 years. And prior to the pandemic, teledentistry was actually limited to certain providers and programs which focused on specific populations. Uh, adoption and uh, adoption of teledentistry prior to the pandemic was uh, hindered by reluctance to innovate uh, around because of concerns around limited access to high-speed internet, as well as devices capable of supporting telehealth applications. Uh, there were concerns about the costs of telehealth infrastructure and software, as well as security, privacy, and HIPAA compliance. Uh, there were concerns about the patient's acceptance of uh, a virtual visit, and also Quite importantly, there were concerns around reimbursement policies, all of which 
adopt, uh, all of which uh, hindered the adoption of teledentistry. But then came the pandemic. <laughs> so with the pandemic, there were mandates and recommendations to either close or limit the provision of dental services. And suddenly providers had to figure out how they can connect with patients uh, when they when patients could no longer come to uh, come to come to the organizations. There were executive orders which encouraged the use of technology to care for patients. Uh, there were federal directives which expanded reimbursement of teledentistry, and also there was a loosening of rather stringent HIPAA requirements, especially early on in the pandemic. For example, uh, early on in the pandemic, it was possible for providers to connect with uh, patients via FaceTime. Now, so this confluence of circumstances actually allowed for a period of rapid adoption and expansion of teledentistry. So the literature shows that during the early months of the pandemic, uh, teledentistry use increased exponentially. In 2020, teledentistry was about 60 times pre-pandemic levels. Now this is uh, from dental practice management data from an healthcare technology company which had aggregated data from over 26,000 provider organizations representing well over 30,000 dentists in all 50 states at DC. However, with, uh, with, when, when dental offices slowly started to reopen, the use of teledentistry uh, decreased somewhat. And by August 2020, uh, that had reduced to a little under 13 times pre-pandemic levels, but still remained quite high. Now, to compare, I have uh, results from the American Dental Association's Health Policy Institute, which did a poll during the pandemic to assess the economic impact of COVID on dental practices. And I want to talk about two particular waves of that tracking poll. Uh, so you see that in, in April, uh, almost 25% of private practices were using uh, teledentistry and that number reduced uh, by July uh, 2020, but still remained significantly higher than pre-pandemic levels. So we know about synchronous and asynchronous teledentistry, which are real time and store and forward uh, respectively. But I want to talk a little bit about what kind of teledentistry modalities were actually used during the pandemic. So we had a project where we used uh, data from the American Association of Medical Colleges, uh, namely their consumer survey of healthcare access, which is field, which is a survey fielded every six months. So we analyzed data from uh, June 2020 through December 2021. And what we found was for first time users of teledentistry during the pandemic, uh, emails were the most commonly used modality followed by mobile apps, text communication, video, and telephone. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the uptake of teledentistry at federally qualified health centers. So the Uniform Data System, or the UDS, is a mandatory reporting system where federally qualified health centers report information about performance and operating metrics to HRSA. So we looked at how uptake of teledentistry changed uh, at FQHCs in 2020 when compared with 2019. And we see that in 2019, there were less than 5,000 teledentistry visits, which increased to well over 200,000 in 2020. That's an increase of almost 42 times. And so there are about 1,400 FQHCs in the US with over 10,000 service sites, uh, with over 10,000 service sites. And in 2019, of those 1,400 FQHCs, only about 418 were offering oral health services via teledentistry. But we see again in 2020, that number increased tremendously from 418 to over 1100 uh, FQHCs. So 
At the Oral Health Workforce Research Center, uh, we did a project titled Teledentistry Adoption and Use During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, we had two objectives. The first was to conduct interviews with uh, key informants in the safety net in the US to understand how teledentistry evolved in the early months of the pandemic. And the second objective of this project was to conduct a review of enabling statutes and regulations to understand how teledentistry regulations varied uh, across the US. So for that, we conducted uh, we, conduct, we conducted a number of, we conducted key informant interviews at 11 safety net organizations, uh, nine of which were FQHCs. We interviewed 26 key informants and they included C-suite staff, clinical directors, non-clinical directors, dentists, dental hygienists, uh, there was a dental assistant as well as administrative staff. And from our, from our, key informant interviews, we identified seven distinct but interrelated thematic findings. So the first finding was that teledentistry was critical in bridging access to care gaps in the initial months of the pandemic. So key informants told us that teledentistry was imperative in mitigating infection risks, uh, in providing care for vulnerable populations, and for addressing oral health concerns of people so that first point of care did not become an emergency department at a time when emergency departments were overwhelmed. Uh, we found out that there was a wide variation of the experiences of key informants. For example, for organizations that had used teledentistry prior to the pandemic, adopting teledentistry was a lot simpler was somewhat easier. And for, for example, for organizations that had a pilot project, uh, for example, there was, a one, there was one particular organization uh, where they had a pilot project to conduct some services via teledentistry, and they too found it quite simpler to adopt and expand care through teledentistry. So you see that organizations that were early innovators for in organizations that were early innovators, patients greatly benefited from that. Uh, the second theme was that the was that teledentistry had the potential to be a satisfactory treatment modality for patients. One provider said that they had patients who would drive for five to six hours to get to their uh, to get to their site, but they didn't know that COVID regulations meant that they needed extra documentation. Uh, so they actually had to turn back and and go back before they were able to come again. So in such populations, in such instances, teledentistry was very useful to screen patients and to advise them of COVID protocols and other documentation that they may need. Uh, patients were somewhat reluctant to uh, engage in teledentistry, but once they were successfully engaged, they were comfortable using teledentistry. And some of the reasons for being reluctant to teledentistry for patients included uh, not knowing the value of teledentistry, there were technology-related barriers, and digital literacy-related barriers. But once patients were fully engaged, they were able to connect with providers, have their questions and concerns addressed. Uh, the fourth uh, thematic finding is that the majority of providers were satisfied with offering services via teledentistry. So some clinicians were somewhat skeptical very early on about teledentistry and its effectiveness. So it was important for organizations to address those concerns and have the necessary buy-in from organizational leadership. Now, there was one key informant uh, who described a strategy they used with this, which was to identify the diagnosis of a patient on a teledentistry visit and then match that diagnosis for when the patient eventually came in for in-person services. And the key informant described that in over 99% of the in, in over 99% of the time, those diagnoses matched. And the only time it didn't match was for a new patient who hadn't shared their full medical history with the dentist on a teledentistry visit. Uh, 
And even though most providers liked offering services through teledentistry, attitudes about teledentistry were not all positive. For example, there was a keen form interview who described that they did not like teledentistry because uh, they cited that children were better behaved in person than on a virtual visit. Overall, however, key informants in well over 50% of the organization indicated that they liked teledentistry so much that they had permanent slots on their provider's schedule for teledentistry, and they planned to continue it well beyond the pandemic. Uh, the fifth theme was that instituting a teledentistry program required trial and error. Organizations had to test uh, different workflow models. Uh, they had to test different teledentistry platforms to see what worked best for them. But, but once they found the uh, teledentistry platform and the process that worked well for them, it was very clear that their patients benefited from that. Uh, there were a number of benefits to using teledentistry that uh, key informants cited. They include uh, triaging patients, expediting diagnosis, affecting treatment and monitoring the patient's recovery. And overwhelmingly, uh, key informants described that with teledentistry, patients were spending less time in the dental chair, and it, which allowed them to think of the dental suite as an operating theater by streamlining much through teledentistry. Another key informant described that for her, the biggest success in using teledentistry was delivering care to patients with special health needs. Uh, this key informant described as, uh, shared a story of a child who had refused to open her mouth. Uh, the parent was somewhat reluctant to uh, engage the provider through teledentistry, but had agreed. And the provider and the child met for several times over teledentistry. And eventually, when the child actually came in for the in-person service, the child was familiar with the provider, the child was happy, the child was clapping, and it allowed the, and it allowed the dentist to complete that, uh, complete the exam and the services during that instance. And uh, key informants also described that uh, teledentistry was very useful for patients with complex medical histories. The final uh, thematic finding we identified from our key form interviews, that was that reimbursement was described as the biggest barrier to providing care through teledentistry. Now, uh, a number of regulations that permitted teledentistry during the pandemic existed so long as the public health emergency did, but that expired. Uh, and reimbursement continued to be a significant concern. So we knew that the teledentistry regulations uh, across states were complex and they varied significantly. So we wanted to compile a dictionary of the, regu of the regulatory parameters for providing teledentistry services in each of the 50 states and DC. So we wanted to understand the basic circumstances and permissions for conducting teledentistry we wanted to determine common elements which could be compared across states. We collaborated with NOAA to identify the most pertinent topics around teledentistry regulation for, uh, for their providers. And we reviewed regulations and guidance documents in every state. And we validated our findings with uh, we validated our findings to uh, with the findings from the Center for Connected Health Policy. Idea and mouthwatch, and we developed the variation in teledentistry regulation by state infograph. So, for this infograph, we looked at eight variables. Uh, we looked at the source of authority to provide teledentistry services. We wanted to see if teledentistry was directly addressed in the Dental Practice Act or in Dental Board Regulation or if it was under the umbrella of telehealth or telemedicine, or if it was a, a dental board or Medicaid directive. The second variable we addressed in our infograph was the types of allowable services. Was it synchronous or synchronous and asynchronous? We looked at 
the modalities for synchronous teledentistry and if other modalities were allowed. We wanted to see if uh, we wanted to see the patient of record requirement. For example, some states only allow teledentistry services if the patient is an established patient. And we want to see if it was possible for a patient to become established at the time of a teledentistry visit. Uh, we also looked at informed consent, the allowed providers, were they dentists only or dentists and dental hygienists? And, and finally, we wanted to look at the reimbursement for the ADA recommended teledentistry codes, CDT D9995 for synchronous and D9996 for asynchronous. I'm not going to talk about all of uh, all eight variables in detail uh, on this webinar, but I will be focusing on four. So what we found uh, in reference to the source of authority to provide teledentistry was that in over 20 states, teledentistry was directly addressed in the, in the Dental Practice Act or Dental Board Regulation. And in 16 states and DC, it was addressed in, it was addressed under the umbrella of telehealth or telemedicine statute. And in eight states, it was a dental board uh, or Medicaid opinion. Actually, I should say it's actually nine states uh, because Pennsylvania was Pennsylvania also allows teledentistry. Now, the infograph which we are sharing with you was. Uh, updated as of end of as of the fourth quarter in 2022. So please keep in mind that some of the regulations may have evolved since then. And in in reference to the types of allowable services, we see that over 40 states allow both synchronous and asynchronous services, asynchronous teledentistry, while a handful only allow synchronous teledentistry. And as far as allowed providers, we see in over 30 states, dentists and dental hygienists are allowed to deliver teledentistry services. Now, this includes New York, because in New York, even though the public health law lists only dentists as being telehealth providers, New York regulations state that all New York State Medicaid providers and providers employed by a New York State Medicaid facility can deliver care. So in New York and also in uh, Pennsylvania, both dentists and dental hygienists can deliver services through teledentistry. And in reference to Medicaid reimbursement, there were 14 states which uh, reimbursed the ADA recommended teledentistry codes. But I do want to add that there are several other states, even though they don't necessarily reimburse D9995 and 9996 themselves, they do reimburse additional codes, uh, additional services uh, identified through corresponding codes. So from the wider literature, from, uh, from the data from FQHCs about the uptake of teledentistry, from our findings, from the key informant interviews, and through the slow and steady uptake of teledentistry, regulatory authority in states, we can see that teledentistry has been effective in bridging access to care in the safety net. And though it is still an emerging practice that it is here to stay. But these are some references. And thank you. Thanks, Fikshana. That was a very informative presentation. Uh, First of all, a reminder to your audience, if you have a question, please ask them using the Q&A panel on your screen. I'll also be monitoring chat just in case, but if you use the Q&A panel, that would be much easier for us. With that said, I, I do have a few questions to start us off as the audience warms up. First, a, a point of clarification. Are the teledentistry regulations listed on the infographic temporary that is like pandemic related? or are they permanent regulations? That is a great question. So when we looked at the uh, regulations, we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to identify regulations that were codified in law. So 
the regulations that are listed in the infograph are permanent and they did not expire with the expiry of the public health emergency back in May. All right, thank you, Thikshana. All right, uh, next question. How does state Medicaid decide which services to reimburse via teledentistry and which to not reimburse via teledentistry? That is a good question, but also a complex one. So the full answer I, 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 is going to be uh, the state Medicaid folks who are going to have to answer that. But what the regulations tell us is that teledentistry services are reimbursed if the service received on a teledentistry service is equivalent to the service received on, a, on an in-person visit. So if they are similar, then then in general, uh, teledentistry, uh, that then a reimbursement is possible. All right, thank you, Fikshan. And once more, if you have a question during the audits, feel free to ask via the Q&A panel or just throw up in there in the chat. And I'm monitoring that as well. Is teledentistry used for school-based oral health programs? That is an interesting question. So I, I mentioned during my reintroduction to teledentistry uh, that teledentistry was used well, be, well before the pandemic and school-based oral health programs is an example of a program where teledentistry was used well before the pandemic. So with the spoke and wheel model of teledentistry, uh, for example, uh, a dental hygienist at a school would uh, do an examination, uh, would do an oral health examination, and sh and record their record those findings, and then send it via teledentistry to a dentist at a clinic who will review those uh, review those charts on their own time, develop a treatment plan, and then send it back through back to the dental hygienist to deliver services. So yes. Uh, school-based oral health or school-based or oral health programs are a very good example of uh, a tele of when teledentistry is is tremendously important. Thank you. That's that's very interesting. Tell me, I, I know you have a lot of work going on at the Oral Health Workforce Research Center right now. Do y'all have any other plans for future teledentistry studies as well that you can share with the audience at this time? That would have been a wonderful question for Dr. Simona Sedir, <laughs> who unfortunately is not here. Uh, but yes, we are thinking of, so uh, among the things that we're looking at is to continue to identify innovative practices uh, and to see what are the, what are situations where teledentistry has been used and proven to be effective and efficient for, uh, for for especially vulnerable and underserved populations, including uh, patients in the safety net. So that is something that we will continue to look at, but the exact nature of those studies is uh, still being determined. So I am more than happy to share more when, when we get to that. All right, wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> now, this presentation, of course, focused on the safety net. What do we know about private practice dentistry? So, for example, the uh, the reference I shared earlier from the Choi et al. article describes that in 2020, uh, teledentistry use increased tremendously early on in the pandemic, and then somewhat decreased and uh, decreased when uh, when organizations and dental practices slowly started reopening, and that very much mirrors the findings from the uh, ADA HPI tracking poll, which also showed that early on in the pandemic, teledentistry was used, and it is while while I, while the data does show, while the data shows that teledentistry is still being used, it has reduced. Uh, I, I I suspect very much, and I think, but I think it'll continue to be something that is going to be used. Interesting, I should say. <laughs> uh, can you tell us a little bit about how 
dental hygienists are providing teledentistry services? Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, for example, with school, again, like I mentioned, with school-based oral health programs, dental hygienists uh, at schools are able to do investigations, are able to uh, do examinations of children and share those findings with uh, with dentists at the at, at the at the at the main organization, and then and then they would implement the treatment plans that are instituted by the by the dentists. So that is well, that is one example of uh, dental hygienists providing teledentist services. Okay, thank you. Um, what next question? Actually, we have a couple of them rolling in now. Um, what types of measures would you recommend for systems to monitor the impacts of teledentistry? I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time, Dave? What types of measures would you recommend for systems like health systems, et cetera, to monitor the impacts of teledentistry? Hmm. I'm going to have to think about that. I'm going to have to think about that a little, and I will, and if I can, mm -hmm. and I, I will definitely try and answer that over the next couple of minutes. If it, if I can think of a, a, a solid answer. If not, I encourage you to reach out to me with that question, and I will give it a little bit more thought and see what the data shows uh, before I respond to before I respond to that question. Next question. Uh, the infographic that you shared with us in your presentation with the key explaining each layer, has your team published this infographic in an article or can it be found on your website? Absolutely. That infograph can be can be found on the Oral Health Workforce Research Center website. And I'm going to use that opportunity for a shameless plugin, which is to uh, which is to go to our website and also sign up for our mailing list to learn more about our, more about what we're doing, uh, more about what we're doing. And the infograph itself has been shared at a number of conferences, but it has not been shared as a peer-reviewed journal, peer-reviewed journal publication, but it has been but it has also been uh, described in a number of reports that were recently published by the Oral Health Workforce Research Center. But yes, FQHCs receive reimbursement under the prospective payment system. It is an encounter-based payment methodology that typically requires a face-to-face -face visit with a medical dental professional practicing independent judgment in the care of the patient. Are, FK, are, are FQHCs paying the PPS rate for these teledentistry services performed in the FQHC setting? If not, what rate is being paid? The rate of the rate the services are offered is going to be dependent on the state, which is something that can be identified uh, on the uh, on, on the reimbursement manual for state Medicaid. Uh, but the rest of the but, but as for the the larger question, that is going to also have to be something I I go back and get back to you on. Okay, thank you. Do other insurers besides Medicaid reimburse for teledentistry services? I have uh, read of a number of other insurers uh, who do reimbursement for who do reimburse for teledentistry services, but that varies very much on the state and the type of insurance. So yes. And and I encourage the uh, the attendees if, if you have uh, the answers to some of these questions, please reach out and share those. We we would love to learn about your experience and to hear from you to learn from the tremendous wealth that is all of you. Next question, Fitshana. Did consumers identify any barriers they encountered in accessing telehealth industry services? Absolutely. Uh, those barriers uh, included uh, high-speed internet connectivity, uh, mobile phones that supported the applications. Uh, those barriers uh, also included uh, translation-related services. For example, there was one organization which described that, uh, which described that they had a uh, that a significant Part of the, popu the population that they served was Spanish speaking, 
And unfortunately, the teledentistry platform that they used did not allow for seamless translation services for that. So, so those so that organization had to explore a number of a number of options to figure out what actually worked best for them. So, so so yes, there there are there are a number of barriers to uh, that the consumers and I would say even providers have identified, but but with continued use through more testing of appropriate uh, product uh, appropriate processes that are that are organization specific i i think those are some things that uh, that that will be addressed slowly but surely with time okay thank you fikshana of course here's a question do you have any examples of how remote patient monitoring was used remote patient monitoring no unfortunately um unfortunately i cannot think of an example right now but so the key informal interviews that we described uh there is a wealth of knowledge in, in those key informal interviews and i'd be more than happy to review our transcripts to see if there is an example of that and i'd be more than happy to uh more than happy to reach out with an answer all right, thank you. A moment here as I look through what we have coming in. Have there been any studies regarding the cost effectiveness of use in teledentistry services? None that I have come across, uh, but but uh, the key informants that we described have, uh, they did mention that uh, Teledentistry is, I mean, tele, uh, offering services through teledentistry does it, it, it does cost them quite a bit of money, but in this, but for one one specific organization, they mention, but there are the benefits, including uh, lower no shows. A, a, again, that might be organization specific. Uh, as far as the cost benefit uh, analysis on teledentistry. I'm, I'm I'm going to uh, an informed response would be yes there is literature but not any that I have uh, recently reviewed so please share your uh, name and email address uh, on, on on the chat and I'd be more than happy to uh, do a quick review and see if I can find any articles that uh, we we can share with you. That said, Fikshana. What's the main takeaway here from your perspective regarding teledentistry services? If when the audience leaves today's event, what's the one thing they should understand? What's, if that makes sense? It does. Uh, teledentistry is effective. Teledentistry is beneficial, uh, especially for patients, uh, especially for underserved, I'd say for all patients, but for in, in instances where dental access is uh, limited, I'd say particularly for those populations, teledentistry is, is tremendously beneficial. So I hope the main takeaway from this webinar is that Teledentistry is doing wonderful things connecting patients with providers right now. And it did so during the pandemic, uh, very much so. It did so before the pandemic. And the pandemic showed us that teledentistry can be useful beyond being used for just a handful of uh, populations and a handful of programs. So there is tremendous potential for teledentistry to be adopted to mainstream media. It has been, but the scope there remains is significant. Wonderful. That's a. That sounds like. Hey, I do not see any more questions coming in. So maybe we'll go ahead and wrap up just a few minutes early today. Uh, with that said, that was a very informative presentation. And for those of you who have questions that are just occurring to you, you know, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be in touch as, and provide you answers as we can. Uh, but with that said, thanks, Shauna. Thank you. It was a very informative presentation. Uh, thanks for attending to us today. And for those of you in the audience, thank you for attending. Uh, we appreciate we appreciate it. And I wish everyone a good afternoon. And
Well, that's that. Thank Goodbye, you so everyone. much, David. Good one, Bye, everyone. Goodbye to everyone in the audience.